Hello, everybody. Welcome into a Tuesday edition of the Computer America Show. I hope all of you had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Uh, caught a good movie, did some barbecuing. Uh, we're in our pre-show. We'll be starting in about uh, about one minute. One minute until showtime. Like she said, and uh, uh, we got a great program planned for you tonight. Uh, in the uh, first hour, we're going to be talking to Lumo Play. They've got an incredible uh, uh, projection system for games. We'll talk about that. Uh, with the, the company's uh, CEO, uh, Meg uh, is here with us tonight. Uh, Atuvle is here. Uh, Atuvle, excuse me, Meg Atuvle. And uh, also in the second hour, we're going to be talking to Razer for all you gamers out there. Uh, we've got the product marketing manager, uh, Jeevan uh, Ven, Ven Arrol, is here with us uh, talking about the, some of the latest devices uh, coming out of Razer. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show as we begin. Two hours of Computer America. Oh, also we got our Logitech winners to announce as well. Okay, here we go. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast-to-coast. Coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And uh, welcome. It's Tuesday. What happened to Monday? Uh, well, it was Memorial Day, so uh, we had a, a little bit of a break. And hopefully all of you enjoyed the, the Memorial Day holidays and, uh, uh, you know, uh, did some barbecuing, uh, went to see a movie, uh, something fun. Hopefully you did that. And uh, uh, it was an, had a pleasant weekend. Hopefully all of you did. And uh, we've got a great show for you planned tonight. Um, also, uh, it is our last Logitech contest, and so we're going to be announcing our three Logitech winners tonight. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be announcing that too. And then what we'll do is we're going to roll uh, the next contest over into our social media contests where it will give people even more chances to win some really cool stuff. So uh, uh, we explained it a little bit before and we'll, we'll continue to uh, update you on how that's going to uh, work. Um, now if you have a comment or a question or a suggestion, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at 347-884-8881. Uh, that's 347-884. 884-8881. I'll get you on and get you through. Uh, you can also join us in our live interactive chat room from our homepage at computeramerica.com uh, right next to the uh, chat button, uh, the home button, excuse me, I'll say show lounge. You can either click on that or just hover, when you hover over it, you can go to the full screen chat. Uh, it'll say, want it, you know, you, you know, you want to chat and just pick a username. That's the name you'll be known by when you go in there and uh, and uh, you're, it's, it's just that simple, and you're in our interactive chat room. But the easiest thing to do is just give us a call at 347-884-8881. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think I covered most of my bases. Anything you want to mention, uh, Ben? Uh, uh, oh, yes, of course, I know. Uh, <laughs> we also welcome you to watch Computer America. Not only can you listen to the show, because uh, we are primarily a basically a radio broadcast, but we also stream the live video. And all of our guests tonight are on the live video, so you can you can watch us. Uh, uh, you can see myself. Ben's got his new interactive uh, background on the video, where he actually displays the website. So it's a it's a lot of fun to watch that. And also, as I said, from time to time, you can see our guests as well. And uh, so another just another way to kind of interact with us. And again, that's all at computeramerica.com. That's right on our home on any page at computeramerica.com. You'll see the video. We we it just starts right up. It's very simple to. Uh, to access that. All right. So, all right. Anything? As I said, Ben. Nothing. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's that's everything, and, and probably a little bit more than we had to. Okay. Well, uh, let's talk about to our first uh, guest tonight. Um, and the the company itself 
is uh, called uh, Lumo Play, and it's kind of interesting because um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm sorry. Lumo Play is, is our second hour guest. What am I thinking? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, the f first hour guest is Razor. That's we're going to be talking to Razor. Yes, exactly. And uh, Razor, uh, for anybody who's a gaming enthusiast, knows that uh, they design, they they make some very cool gaming products. Uh, their their products are based on three fundamental tenets, and that's technology, ergonomics, and validation for the very best professional gamers. World class scientists and engineers develop cutting edge technology in house. Or with partners, uh, design products with extensive human interfacing studies, and then test the hell out of them <laughs> in, the, in the field with pro gamers uh, before the launch. Now, here to discuss the latest from Razer is their product marketing manager, uh, Jivan Aro. Uh, Jivan, uh, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Hi, Craig. Hi, Craig. I'm I'm good. How's everyone tonight? Uh, we're doing fine. So. Um, I know uh, uh, Ben is our, our gaming enthusiast here on the program and uh, uh, is, is very familiar with uh, your, your different products. I think that the Razer mouse is, 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 is absolutely... Yeah, yeah that, was, that, that was my first real foray into Razer equipment was uh, either the Razer headset or the Razer Naga. So. Uh, but but yeah, that, that, started a, that, that started a lifelong affair, if you will. <laughs> nice, nice. That's always good to hear, especially from uh, fellow gamers. So, tell us a little bit about. Give us a little background on Razer for people who might be hearing might be hearing about it for the first time. Uh, uh, the company. Tell us about Razer itself. Well, okay. So, um, Razer is um, one of the world's um, most successful gaming peripherals manufacturers. We specialize mainly in um, providing the best gaming experiences, experiences possible to um, our, our, our customers, uh, gamers, and um, just uh, PC enthusiasts alike. We have, um, we have quite a lineup today. Um, we have computer mice, we have keyboards, we have um, headsets, um, audio, audio um, earplugs, as well as um, recently, we, we, we just recently launched the uh, Nambu X as well, which is kind of like a, 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 social, a social band a Bluetooth social band that helps monitor your, um, you know, social activities. Okay. Uh, uh, yep. So um, I'm really here today to talk more about one of the initiatives that um, we that that Razer just embarked on, called the Open Source Virtual Reality Initiative. Right, and that and 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 that's OSVR, uh, which we're going to be talking about exactly what uh, what that's all about, and the open source virtual reality. What is that? Okay, so OSVR, or Open Source Virtual Reality, is an initiative founded by Razer and Sensix. So Sensix is uh, one of our partners, and they specialize in making military-grade uh, virtual reality headsets. And together, um, you know, we are, we are kind of focused on um, virtual reality gaming and making gaming, uh, making VR gaming possible. Uh, OSVR exists in order to solve hardware and software fragmentation that currently exist in the VR market. And um, it is both a software platform as well as a HDK, uh, which is kind of like a, a hacker's development kit, if you would call it, um, you know, a VR head-mounted display that allows for viewing of VR content. OK. So can, can you elaborate a, little, elaborate a little bit more on, on, on the software platform here? Because uh, I'm not the, the, uh, the gamer. And, and how does this... How does this uh, uh, how does this involve uh, involve you know gaming? I mean, wh how does it kind of interact? Okay, so um, OSVR primarily um, exists to make virtual reality gaming happen. Um, you know, right now there's tons of fragmentation in the market, uh, mainly because um, there are lots of new technologies and virtual reality is an emerging industry um, that requires a lot of developer effort. I mean, the same developers that make video games for 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 everyone to play, um, and and um, you know it. It, it makes it very challenging for them to actually work together. So um, the OSVR software platform actually resolves this by setting a standard uh, through which um, um, hardware and software can both work together. Um, it's essentially a middleman that gets various VR hardware and software technologies to shake hands and work together. So um, the end result basically is all gaming content 
working with um, all sorts of virtual reality uh, technology um, and peripheral devices. And uh, basically that, that benefits the gamers because at the end of the day, there's no limit to what type of uh, hardware or peripheral configuration they can enjoy virtual reality gaming on. Okay. Uh, ben, you're going to chime in here a little bit more because this is all over my head as far as gaming. Uh, so why don't you uh, talk to him a little bit about it? I mean, you you follow what he's talking about? Uh, a little bit because this is so new. That this is uh, something that I guess we we've heard about in the last couple of years with virtual reality. But uh, as for an end product actually coming to market, uh, not so much. And I guess this is uh, you know Razer's attempt to you know really decide the platform because it. It's great that you know Facebook has jumped into this, and it's great that uh, you know so many other companies have jumped into this. But like, there, there hasn't been one good platform, I think, or you know, at least one that, that's really come to market. So this is your attempt, right, to to solve that problem. Yes, exactly. I mean, um, end of the day, OSVR is essentially a, a neutral platform, and what we want to do is get everyone on board. We we want we want to get Oculus. We want to get um, you know. Uh, HTC, Vive, uh, Steam, um, anyone and everyone who's making virtual reality gaming technology uh, to come and kind of get on board so that we can we can provide more content and more hardware options to gamers. So uh, and and Razer really uh, and and Razer really has a storied history with, with hardware and this is. Because virtual reality is definitely going to have a hardware component, and I'm sure Razer's going to jump on that with their own virtual reality headset. But how were they in the software department? Because a lot of this is is brand new, you know, coding. Well, um, I'm not the best person to talk about that. Um, oh. to talk to you about that, but oh, no. um, uh, why well, well, in uh, you know uh, precisely for OSVR, like uh, just. You got like what makes you guys better than let's say Facebook, who has billions of dollars, and let's say something, you know, uh, the PlayStation is coming out with. Like, what makes OSVR, you know, the best open source uh, platform for all, all these devices? Okay, so um, just just to be um, clear about it, we we are not really looking to compete or be better than than Oculus or Facebook. Um, OSVR is essentially an, an industry supported movement and we have about 118 supporters on board. These supporters contribute their software technology, they contribute their hardware technology and what we do together with our partners um, is essentially facilitate uh, the use of that technology between each other. Um, it's, it's, it's an open platform and, um, and, and yeah, that's... Okay. Right. Okay, that, that and that makes perfect sense. And when you're taking something on like this, where where do you begin? Because it, it's uh, if it's open source, are you guys creating a brand new game engine from from scratch? Are you got like a uh, what what exactly was the challenge that you guys for space to you know do all this? Well, the biggest challenge I you know um, I have to say is um, getting supporters on board. I mean, we have a great platform. Um, we have great talent and heritage behind this, and um, you know we've we've been working we've been working really really hard to get um, all sorts of VR developers on board the platform just so that we can make it work. And it's been really really successful. Um, to date, we have about 118 supporters on board. Um, you know, we have supporters ranging from AAA content developers like Ubisoft, uh, Gearbox Software, um, and VR hardware developers like Virtuix, Nod, and Leap Motion. And um, you know, we, we also recently announced the platform's upcoming support for uh, Valve's OpenVR platform. So OpenVR is essentially developed by Valve to create a pathway for VR hardware to support uh, Steam and other leading platforms. We also got um, Motor Game and Vorpex, which are, which are essentially um, software platforms that allow um, current gaming technology to be translated to virtual reality gaming technology. And yeah, we've been making lots of headway in that in that regard. And um, because OSVR really is about our community, uh, the, the, the larger the community grows, um, the more the more compelling our platform will become for gamers. And at the end of the day, that's our objective, to give gamers um, you know, as much content as possible, as much VR content as possible on one platform to enjoy. Perfect, uh, you know, perfectly noble goal. And, and something that really struck me there was you guys are actually working on uh, developing uh, 
developing software so that you can port existing games to virtual reality. Uh, like, I, I never really thought of, thought about that because you know when you create a virtual reality game, it's so much different than uh, than a traditional game. Are do you think porting uh, of existing uh, franchises and, and existing games is going to be a popular thing? Well, um, actually, to, to clarify that, we, we, we're not developing a technology for that, but um, we have integrated the technology that allows for that. Um, there are, there is a very famous uh, uh, um, porting technology called Vopex, and what Vopex essentially does is take um, conventional gaming technology um, and translates that um, into a format that can be viewed on virtual reality headsets. I mean, um, when you're talking virtual reality, you're not just talking about uh, looking at, at you know beautiful 3D landscapes. You're looking at uh, something that's more akin to 3D, where there has to be depth technology. So when you move your head, you know you can look around. Um, and Vorpex essentially allows um, us to do that. Allows us to take conventional games like GTA V. I think that was one of the the, the more recent additions to Vorpex, and turn it into a virtual reality experience. Oh, I, I, I bet virtual, uh, you know, uh, ver, uh, GTA V has been such a popular game. I, I've, I've no doubt that that's going to get a lot of love from the open source community. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it's just right for, you know. Uh, let, let me ask yeah. you this, because again, I, I'm coming. I, usually, it's the opposite. I, I'm then it's kind of asking the uh, more innocent questions, and, I, and, we, and we get technical. But with gaming, I'm not as familiar because I'm, uh, I'm nowhere near. Uh, the proficient gamer that Ben is. Ben is, 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 is really knows his gaming stuff. So, but I understand what open source is and 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 how. I guess, uh, um, uh, Jivan, what what is your what is the uh, mission here? What what does Razer? Why is Razer uh, supporting this open? Uh, yeah, Craig, we're kind of moving away from Razer and we're just focusing on OSVR. Right. Razer's okay. out of the conversation. It's out of the conversation. So so. What is your intent to to w with OSVR? I mean, why do you want to? Why do you want to? Uh, um, uh, uh, what advantages will will people get by embracing uh, OSVR into their uh, into their product? Okay, Craig. So to answer that, I kind of have to um, just backtrack a bit. Um, you know, the best way for me to answer this is to first talk about virtual reality and its ideals. I mean, um, you know, um, we've all grown up um, watching shows like Tron, The Matrix, and you know, animes like Ghost in the Shell, um, yeah. as well as reading great sci-fi literature like Neil Stephenson and Chris Moriarty's works, and um, all of them feature elements of virtual reality in it. Um, because of this, uh, virtual reality itself is very much a dream for us to achieve, and um, you know, there is very strong desire and interest to make it happen. Uh, the thing is that we did try to make VR happen about 10 years ago, but due to a lot of unforeseen circumstances, including the cost and availability of technology, technology um, it kind of stagnated and didn't go anywhere. Um, clearly, that's not a problem today. However, VR as an emerging industry, um, you know, there are tons of many new technologies out there and not one standard to ground them. Um, there is a possibility that the market will be too fragmented to actually develop any consumer interest. So. This is where OSVR comes in. It's really about uniting people under a single standard to push VR forward, to push you know um, the, the 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 VR developers that we've met. I mean, we've 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 met many VR developers over the past couple of months, and they're extremely passionate individuals with amazing ideas and visions for what VR should be. And end of the day, it's OSVR really exists because it will be fantastic to see a world five years from now where. Virtual reality plays a huge part in recreational and social experiences. Now, in the chat room, uh, there's a question here, and, and I guess the, I guess which leads to some of the confusion. He, uh, he's asking, is this software going to take other games and make them uh, uh, VR? And the, is that what he's hearing? And the, that's what he wants to know. Is that what he's hearing? Is this is this going to take standard games and make them virtual reality? Um, yes and no. So just to reiterate uh, once again, the software platform is essentially, um, think of it as a middleman. Think of it as a middleman for different types of virtual reality technologies. Um, if developers put um, their technology on OSVR, all their different hardware and content um, uh, tech, uh, devices will work together through OSVR, and um, the end result to consumers would be uh, games working with different types of VR devices, um, 
different types of VR devices supplementing the type of experience you get, um, you know, playing a game. I mean, there's so many types of uh, VR controller controllers out there. I mean, we have Leap Motion that essentially has got motion controllers, which means that when you raise your hands up um, and, and put it in front of the Leap Motion camera, you can see your hands in the virtual world. And when you move your hands, your hands move in the virtual world as well. That's one type of controller. And then there's um, the STEM controller from Sense6, which is essentially um, kind of like a, uh, it's, it's a controller that you hold on to. And as you rotate it, your weapon or your hand in the virtual world will rotate. So there's so many ways to control games. And what OSVR does is give content developers that many options through which gamers can control their games with. Um, at the same time, um, I mean, there, there are so many virtual reality headsets out there today. Um, there's the Oculus, there's the Vive, there's the Sony Morpheus. Um, there are many, many uh, uh, indie developers coming up with their own headsets. And end of the day, if your content is on the platform, it will work with all those devices. All right, so, if they happen to be on the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so tell us about your current supporters. Who, who's supporting the OSVR uh, platform? Okay, so we have um, we have tons of supporters ranging from AAA content developers like uh, Ubisoft, Gearbox, and and um, VR hardware developers like Vertuix, Snot, and Leap Motion. Vertuix um, recently released, or they have um, this device called the Omni, which is an omnidirectional treadmill. Basically, you sit on it, or you stand on it, and you start walking, and you're walking around the virtual world. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that reminds. I don't know if you saw that. That, that comes to mind a movie uh, that I saw, Disclosure, with uh, Michael Douglas. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but the, he had a treadmill that he was walking around while wearing the VR headset, and he was walking. And I saw that. Uh, that was then I think in the uh, late '90s I think that came out, or the early 2000s. And I said, "No, nah, that's not going to happen." You know, <laughs> and look at that, <laughs> baby steps. Yeah. Yes, steps. exactly. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but uh, a lot of the, uh, the 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 virtual reality was based and on. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was also showed off at uh, CES this year, uh, or, or somewhere. That there was a recent gaming convention where where technology like that was showed off. Uh, I I I myself kind of question that everyone's going to have this full size treadmill kind of clunky thing in, in the middle of their living room, but uh, as a proof of concept, very very promising. We can have it of course. Gym. I mean, you can have it in the gym and have a workout. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's baby steps, right? I mean, end of the day, um, I guess, I guess, um, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of tech, VR technology that is very disruptive to what we do. Um, but um, you know, we have no doubt that given three, four, or five years from now, um, you know, they they will be pretty widely adopted. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so just to kind of address the confusion about OSVR. Um, we are we are a software platform that's essentially middleware, and at the same time we are also developing a hackers development kit or a HDK, which is a virtual reality head-mounted display. Um, basically, the, the the hackers development kit is fully open source, just like the platform, and um, it, because it's fully upgradable and modular, and can be downloaded for free and be 3D printed from our website. Um, we'd like to call it. Um, the PC to the consoles of VR um, because it gives VR enthusiasts and gamers the freedom to upgrade the technology within the unit to keep up with technological improvements without having to invest in a complete new head-mounted display. I mean, we, we, if, if we think about the current uh, gaming technology in the market, I mean, we have we have PC PC games, PC gaming cons platforms. We have uh, consoles like the Xbox and the Sony Morpheus, I mean, the Sony PlayStation. Um, our, our, our VR headset is, is basically um, sitting on the PC camp of things. Um, you can buy it at a really affordable price. From there, you can, you can swap out uh, different types of display technologies and audio technologies as well as visual technologies in order to uh, uh, keep up with technological improvements um, you know, in, in the industry. And um, that's the one thing that differentiates us from the existing VR, VR headsets um, today. All yeah, right. I, I, I mean, j just looking at this thing, it's it's very, very customizable. And, and you said it's all open source, so this is something that people can, you know, can, can purchase from from you guys and actively develop their, uh, you know, the, their their software on using this. And and the the OSVR headset will actually kind of be 
just like, if not, you know, uh, close enough to all the other platforms uh, that I mentioned before, that if you if you develop it and it works with OSVR, it'll work with everything else. Yes, correct. So end of the day, um, people can people can can buy can buy the full unit, or they can three D three D print the the plastic components. Um, and from there they can for free, and from there they can start uh, customizing it and uh, changing the display technology, the optic technology, and anything and everything about it. Um, we think what's beautiful about this is that um, for developers, I mean, it really is a test platform that allows them to quickly prototype and test how different head-mounted display technologies can work with their products. All right. And, and yep. And of course, you know, it gives it gives gamers tons of options when it comes to um, finding the best experience for their for their VR gaming. Uh, do you plan to show this off at like an E3 and some of the upcoming? Uh, that's that's oh, that's a big uh, big gaming convention that's coming up. Uh, do you plan to have a presence there? Yes, um, we, we, we do. Razer is going to be having a, a booth, and we do plan on on showing off the recent uh, developments and enhancements that that we've we've made for for the product at E3. Okay. All right. Um. So um, when do you? When when is this all happening? I mean, you're releasing the uh, the hardware developer kit now. So that's really going to be in two stages. Next month, we plan on distributing the, the developer kit to um, all our current supporters, all 118 of them. Um, we want to get we want to give them a, a, a head start um, into developing for the platform, and the HGK is a great way to do it. Following that, in July, we will be shipping commercial units. Um, and making it available for for the public to purchase. Okay, what is it, what's something that's going to cost? Well, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be coming in at about USD one nine nine. So it's 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 pretty affordable. It's pretty affordable um, in general, uh, based on on the current price estimates that are going around for um, the more popular VR headsets in the industry. And one of the reasons why we can do that is because, once again, we go back to it being uh, completely moddable and completely upgradable. Now, uh, you're the product marketing manager for Razer, correct? Uh, yep. So, so, and I know we're talking about this, but, but um, um, is, is Razer backing the OSBR, uh, this, this uh, initiative? Uh, are they the are they the company that's bringing it to everybody else? Um, yes and no. So <laughs> um, the <laughs> I mean yeah. So that's that's a standard marketing answer, right? Yeah. So um, end of the day, the OSVR initiative um is co-founded by Razer, um, and co-founded by a couple of our other technological partners like Sensix. So as mentioned previously, Sensix has experience in developing um, um military-grade professional uh, VR headsets. So um, together with Sense6, what we're doing is uh, we, we are facilitators, basically, right? Uh, we, develop, we develop the technology for the um, for our OSVR heads up, uh, head display set. And at the same time, we, we uh, facilitate um, the technology. We get uh, developers, hardware and software to come on board to, to um, increase the compatibility of their, of their content and their products. And through that, um, you know, um, and through that, we kind of we, we, we kind of uh, grow OSVR and, and grow support for the movement. Okay. Yeah. You, I, I mean, just the names that you were throwing out there. There's a lot of research that that, that they've already done, especially with Leap Motion. Uh, we've had them on the show, and you know, we've talked to them. They do great things with with motion tracking, and. It, we haven't really had a, a company on in the past few months to talk about virtual reality, uh, and since it was last on, they've. Uh, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit outside the purview, but how is uh, how is the latency issue lately? Uh, ju just as an aside, uh, I don't know if you've actually had hands on with these devices, but how is the latency issue? Is that getting better? And you know, I guess with all the people you're working with, if anyone's going to get it right. It seems like it, it's it's going to be OSVR. Well, I'm really not the best person to talk to about that, um, but I, I can say that we are. I mean, we we are we are we are ramping up our the technological improvements on our side, and uh, we plan on on showcasing uh, a unit. Um, I mean, a, a HDK at E3 that um, well basically will will help to answer your question. 
All right, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're gonna have guys out at E3, so we'll definitely send them your way and and have them uh, check us out hands on. That's gonna be really uh, very very cool. And uh, I know we're coming back uh, coming up on the break, but we still have a lot to uh, mm-hmm. to, to talk about, and it's probably gonna be more on on the hardware side and, and more specifically what you know what kind of uh, what makes a modular headset better than just a you know one size fits all finished project? Uh, some some more stuff about the hardware, some more stuff about the software, all that kind of thing. So, okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, you, uh, you listen to the Computer America show. Uh, ben and I are talking to Giovanna Roll, who is the product marketing manager with Razer, and we're d- talking about OSVR uh, and uh, the uh, the kit that they are making for that that they're looking to get as many uh, gaming uh, companies uh, involved. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to announce our first uh, Logitech winner. And also, we have not one but two brand new uh, news tip full reviews from Marty Winston. That's right, and the first one we're going to be airing when we come back. Uh, and coming up in the next hour, uh, we're going to have uh, Lumo Play is here with us. That is that one too. Yeah, very cool technology. Turns the floor <laughs> into a gaming area with their very cool projection system. Uh, we're going to be right back. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Don't go anywhere. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-866-663-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. So, disable the cable and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-866-663-MY-TV right now to sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and up to four rooms. And there's no equipment to buy. That includes your free HD TV upgrade, your free DVR upgrade, and your free professional installation. And the best part, the pristine digital picture and sound. Call 1-866-663-MY-TV. So, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. Disable the cable, cut costs, and get more. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. 1-866-663-MYTV. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? (laughs) That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect day and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. One more time, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Ryobi 8-inch Bench Grinder. The last time we used a bench grinder was an 8th grade metal shop, so it was high time to add one to our workbench. Most bench grinders get used for sharpening lawnmower blades, chisels, screwdriver blades, or twist drill bits. Or you can swap one or both of the heavy stone grinding wheels for wire brushes to remove surface rust and rough polished metal pieces. We got in the Ryobi BG828G 8-inch bench grinder for review. Its big motor reaches 3600 RPM, spinning both big stone grinding wheels in so nice a balance that it runs almost silently and takes almost two minutes to coast to a stop when you turn it on. A spark guard over each wheel is mounted with an LED light accessory, one on each side using two AAA cells each, with a good view of the work. Spark guards are good, but don't even turn it on without wearing eye protection. 
The work rest on the right is flat and nicely positioned for sharpening, well, chisels, for example. The one on the left has an angled groove that's a major help when sharpening drill bits. Bottom line, the Ryobi BG828G 8-inch bench grinder is a big improvement over hand tools. One you'd love to have things go faster for important gear maintenance work. This is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bullet Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Uh, thank you, Marty Winston, for that News Tips Bullet Review. Uh, it is our Gamer Tuesday. There. Hmm? Yeah. No, I'm yeah. Fine. Uh, yeah. So, uh, welcome back to our Gamer Tuesday. And uh, before we get back to uh, before we get back to Jivan. Uh, here from OSVR, we should announce, because we have three of them, we don't want to just cram them all in at the end, we'll space them out, so we should announce our first Logitech winner uh, for our giant Logitech contest. Okay, alright, uh, and this is for the Logitech HD Webcam C310 dot at $50, okay, 50 bucks, wow, and uh, this goes to... Jeffrey Morgan. <laughs> Jeffrey Morgan, congratulations. Uh, Jeffrey uh, listens to us in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. Okay, and he actually has a comment. We always, we love comments. He says, "Love the show, guys!" Exclamation point. Keep up the good work! Exclamation point. Thanks! Exclamation point. <laughs> so obviously very enthusiastic. So, uh, Jeffrey, you're our third place winner. Uh, congratulations. We have two more winners coming up a uh, little later on in the uh, program. Uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, welcome back to... Uh, no, no, and uh, yes, as I said before, uh, uh, Mr. Jivan Arol is here with us. He is the product marketing manager and uh, for Razer, but we're here talking about the OSVR. And uh, one thing that uh, I... You know that I saw on your website. I was very very excited about because if you can tell from the video, I myself wear glasses, and I'm sure many other gamers and nerds are prone to do the same. And one thing uh, that that I really like about your headset is that it, it comes built in with it. Is uh, let's see if I can find the exact thing here. Is your optics module, and that's that's a godsend for people like me, isn't it? Yes, I mean, uh, okay, so end of the day, um, our optics modules are independently adjustable, which means that you can have um, a pretty decent experience without having your glasses on. Um, I, I myself um, do wear glasses, and end of the day, when I take off my glasses to, to try on other headsets, um, I have issues actually um, viewing content properly. With the independent adjustable modules, you can actually configure and, and adjust the position of the lenses so that you're able to see... Um, a bit more given, given you know the, the fact that that um, we wear glasses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, the other beautiful thing about our optics is that they have the lowest uh, distortion distortion on the market at about less than thirteen percent. Wow. Um, distortion meaning basically when 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 um, you view three D stereoscopic content, which is the format um, VR headsets uh, display, um, there tends to be things like like um, like a chromatic distortion, chromatic aberration, and stuff, which which um, blends colors and distorts pictures. With the lenses that we use, uh, we essentially get that down to less than thirteen percent, which um, is 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 pretty is pretty high in the market currently. Uh, now, Jivan, are you saying that you have to be an optometrist to wear these things? I mean, I mean, it's like <laughs> what looks better, one or two? Yeah. Or two? Better, worse. Better, worse. <laughs> well, not. <laughs> well, well, not not really. I mean, the the idea end of the day is that um you put the headset on, yeah. um you loosen the optics modules and you kind of push them back and forth, left and right. It takes about uh, ten seconds the most, and then you you tighten them and you're good to go. What if you have like an astigmatism? I mean, all these different things that the glasses can correct and. Uh, I mean, can you you compensate for that as well? Um, I can't um, comment on that one hundred percent, but um, I, I I don't I don't think so at the moment. I'm sure down the line, you know, we, we can have lenses to do that. But end of the day, the 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 primary purpose of the lenses would be to um, improve the visual experience of the of 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 the VR display headset. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure any any kind of cost, uh 
any kind uh, of customization is, is going to be welcome. It, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, th this kind of stuff is still very, very uh, proprietary. So the stuff is very, very new. So uh, you know, just the fact that you, you've given that any thought is you know more than enough. And uh, we, we, you know, we're talking about the hardware here, but at the end of the day, there, there, there has to be people using it. And for these people, they're going to be, you know, maybe a couple guys in, in their garage and they're going to be working on it. It, it could be, lo, you know, lone people really working on a passion project. It could be AAA titles and they're, you know, using this left, right, and center. What are you doing to uh, support these developers uh, as, you know, as this open platform? Are, are you guys just giving material or what exactly is going to be your role in supporting these developers? Well, first and foremost, um, we, 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 we will issue um, the HDK to every single supporter that we have on our network. Um, to be fair to them, um, developing for a new platform can be very intimidating. I mean, virtual reality in general is, is a new technology. So um, every supporter that signs up with us will get a HDK to experiment on. And again, um, I'm, as I mentioned previously, because it's upgradable and modular, there's really no limit to what they can do. Um, different types of games will require different types of um, motion controls and hand gestures to 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 um, play 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 properly. And um, the HDK actually allows them to swap out, for example, the faceplate um, on the module to something with, like, for example, an IR uh, motion tracking faceplate that helps to complement their gaming experience better. So end of the day, it, it just gives developers more freedom with one device to, to experiment and play around with and ultimately um, test their OSVR supported content. For consumers, um, it allows them to play anything and everything that's integrated with OSVR um, that's, that's going to be contributed via our supporters um, that I mentioned, for example, like, like Ubisoft, Gearbox, um, etc. By the way, I, I did a little quick research here during the break. Uh, the name of the movie which I mentioned was Disclosure. It was, it was uh, Michael Crichton directed. It was Michael Douglas and uh, Demi Moore and Donald Sullivan. And this this film was came out in 1994, and they were showing off of the treadmill and the uh, virtual reality glasses. This is in 94 this movie came out. And Alex, I'll take things no one <laughs> asked for trivia about for yeah, 400. But Thank you. Really I, I, the, the, fact, the fact that they were they were talking about this back in '94 before any of this stuff. Came out. That's 20 years. That's over 20. We years. kind of talked about this on, on, on our on our previous shows, and that's you know the the people that grew up on science fiction, on fantasy, on uh, you know Star Trek, and what they saw as quote unquote future. They're the same people you know viewing that kind of content back in the '80s and '90s and '70s. They're the same people who are making today's technology, who are making technology that they want and that they think is futuristic. So, of course, they're going to draw on their experiences to what they know, and that is exactly. you know, the movies of the 80s and 90s. Devon, I recommend exactly. yep. you, should, you should rent that movie and watch it because you're going to be amazed. I mean, they're talking I, about, I, you've seen it? Yeah, I think I, I've seen I've seen it when I was a little younger. I can barely remember it, but, um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting movie. I, I think I do recall that scene with the treadmill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, anyway. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah. sorry, go ahead, Craig. No, go ahead. so Ben, you were you asked you had another question. No, no, uh, no. Actually, uh, uh, Giovanni, you actually sound like you wanted to say something there. Yeah, I mean, and and I mean, going back to the point about how you know um, movies in the past, like like Disclosure, or you know, movies that that came out in 1994, actually had uh, new ones, had glimpses into what VR, virtual reality, would be like. Um, it's it's really what what excites us the most over here. I mean, end of the day, virtual reality is almost like an urban urban legend. It's it's a dream, it's a myth, and and um, the fact that we've met so many developers out there that uh, you know trying to get this to become a physical reality is really, really exciting. And, um, you know, that ties back again to, to what OSVR's vision is really is, which is to um, unify um, all these people, put them on one platform, and, 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 and let consumers play with everything. Yeah, I, I, I really do have high hopes for you guys because uh, I guess the first thing we kind of saw, uh, you know, the first thing I did was PlayStation Connect, and, and that was, uh, I don't want to say it was gimmicky, but it was pretty gimmicky, 
and the the technology was new. It, they they had like a dance game, and they had you know some kind of fun games, and they had like a few action games out there that that y you could do uh, gesture controls with. But at the end of the day, it, it just it just wasn't there, and interest really did fizzle out. Like even though they came out with the Connect Two, and and the other PlayStation uh, uh, you know pieces, people kind of you know said hey motion you know motion controlled or, or, or motion games that's just for either kids or uh, as an aside but I'm not getting that feeling for virtual reality because a lot of people are trying to put their energy behind it and it virtual reality it, it's messy right now because it's all in the future we're, we're hearing about all the development going on but there's there's still a lot of excitement that this is going to be Maybe not the future of gaming, but at least a, a large segment of what gaming could become. Exactly. I mean, end of the day, it's really about engineering a tipping point. Tipping point being when mainstream interest actually actually uh, flourishes, when people come on board and start uh, purchasing and enjoying these experiences. And um, again, I mean, that, that's really where OS VR is coming, uh, coming from. Uh, there's so much new technology. There's so much of fragmentation. Everyone's developing something interesting, but um, it's 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 everywhere. It's all over the place. There's there's not one avenue a consumer can go to to get to experience all these devices, all these content out there. And um, end of the day, OSVR just helps to facilitate that. I mean, as long as you are integrated with OSVR and are on the platform, um, consumers can 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 play. It. Play, play, you know, anything you have to offer. So, uh, and and uh, again, uh, excuse my ignorance, but is this going to be a a platform on which maybe like Steam, where you have you know a, a game and then you can download mods and that kind of thing, or are you going to try to integrate yourself in with other digital distribution platforms, and then you're like you're going to are you going to try to completely remove yourself and just kind of be like you know uh, direct. You know, just like direct access now with, with video games, are you going to try to you know remove yourself as much as you can and let people take the content that they create using OSVR to other platforms, or do you want to be the next Steam? We are looking to be just to be a middleman to facilitate things. End of the day, how people use their content, distribute their content, and sell their content is completely up to them. Um, OSVR is 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 primarily a mechanic that gives them, uh, that broadens the compatibility for their content. But at the end of the day, um, I mean, the beauty about the platform is that is that we currently have many um, VR app stores supported as well. So if you're a content developer that actually integrates with OSVR, you have the option to put your content on those platforms, and we're not and, and we're not going to dictate how do you do it. Um, of, obviously, you kind of have to work out your own your own deals and, and pricing structures with those platforms. But at the end of the day, it's open, um, and we are not here to dictate anything. We're not here to control anything. Um, the platform will evolve with the community and it, it will stay that way. That That is one of the smartest things I've heard. It, it, it's When you try to shoehorn people into using, you know, uh, and we see it with a lot of things where it's, it, it, it makes sense at face value where you say, okay, use our stuff in our ecosystem and you'll get people, you know, and we'll get not only developers, but we'll also get uh, you know the people playing these games. You know, come to us and we'll do this. But people don't like to be, uh, uh, you know, segmented like that. They they like to play with their friends, and that can take place in many different forms and many different uh, platforms. So, you know, just you guys being being available and anything that people create, they can take it anywhere they want. Of course, there there's there's gonna have to be some mention along the way that hey, OSVR was used this, and, you know, was was used. And that's perfectly fine, but at least you guys don't, you know, put a giant watermark over the middle of the screen and say, "Hey, yeah. this is OSVR only." You know, you're using it on so-and-so platform, not OSVR. Like there, like none of that kind of stuff, which is very nice. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, we we are neutral and and we don't have any. Con I mean, we we don't control anyone. Um, yeah, we just want to make VR so, happen, <laughs> and, so, uh, and we think that this is the best way to do it. Yeah, and and what. Uh, I guess, what are you guys uh, getting out of it? Uh, I, I kind of read a little bit on your website about how hardware-wise, um, anything you develop for, for OSVR, it kind of meant, and, and, and you know, it got kind of a little bit confusing there, but if you um, kind of 
tinker with the 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 OSVR uh, uh, headset module, like anything that you kind of uh, change a little, you know, change a little bit, kind of goes the, the rights go back to OSVR and Razer. But anything that you create to work with it is still belonging to you. Like how far does your you know uh, copyright and uh, you know licensing go with OSVR? So, uh, software and hardware-wise. Okay, so. Okay, so the best way to answer, answer that question is to kind of go back to to what we are about. I mean, end of the day, we are open source and we believe in in sharing everything. So, um, what what that um copyright and what that that statement basically means is that end of the day, you can take the HDK, you can modify it, and whatever technologies that you're using to connect to it, it's yours. It's in your control. But for example, if if you modify the the faceplate, maybe um, and and you add a bracket or a clip that um, that kind of um, mounts the technology that that you're inventing, then um, that clip and that and that and that piece and that placement um, will will go back to the community. So end of the day, someone else can can use that that bracket and okay. and and adapt their own technology to it. Yeah. And and, and uh, with open source, that's that's what you want. You, you want people sharing as much as possible. It, it, it's not so much about saying, okay, here, here's what I did. Yeah, I took this nice little unicorn sticker and I put it on the side of the headset and now this whole headset is mine. You are not allowed to use anything that I do with it from this point forward. It, uh, open source, it's, it's, it's that great two-way street that I think a lot of developers are very much behind where we're going to work on this and then if you want to use something like that, uh, you know, go ahead. The, it's all about sharing, and at the end, of, and and hopefully, the the better experience is for the player, it, it, is for the gamer, which is amazing, perfect. It, it's just what you want. So, exactly. and, and, yeah, uh, I guess the hardware we we've covered, the software we've covered. Uh, you, you mentioned the next time that people are going to be able to, to have a demonstration is going to be at E3. What are you guys planning for, for E3? Well, that's a surprise. I can't reveal oh. that right now. But oh, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be um, substantial. <laughs> okay, it's going to be substantial. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to have our, our, our people out there, and you know, we're going to tell them to hunt you guys down. I don't know where you're going to be hiding. It's going to be like an Easter egg hunt, So, uh, but we'll definitely find you out there. Uh you know, I j just trying to think of uh, of anything else that we might not have covered because. Well, it, hmm? I was going to ask, where can we actually see this, or where are you next going to be demo demo? Well, yeah, that that E three, I think. E three. Is that correct? Yep, correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, um, and, and we, we could, go ahead. We could talk about um how how we actually plan on supporting the developers that want to come on board if oh, sure. if you guys want to hear that. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay, so so um, as 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 I mentioned, we we we, we first and foremost we do want to give um a, you know a HDK to everyone to kind of use, but at the same time because um, OSVR is, is is a network of developers, um, we can also link up new supporters to the other supporters in our network so that they can leverage off the technology. Um, it's 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 very it's very community driven. So end of the day, if you're a game developer. And and you want to test out how um, your game works in a particular type of technology? We can link you up with that with that technology owner, and you can improve your game based on that. Um, so that's one of the one of the other perks that we that we uh, give our supporters. Um, the other thing is that we we also provide priority access to our OSVR support portal, and because end of the day, um, OSVR is co-founded by Razer, um, we have we have. A very wide reach in terms of promotional and marketing, and if you're a small small developer or a medium-sized developer and need and needs a little push um, in terms of exposure and eyeballs, we can give them that as well. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah. T uh, uh, teaming up with these big names uh, doesn't doesn't hurt, and, and Razer has probably one of the best reputations with gamers out there. It, it's it's. It, <sighs> Facebook is great, and, and PlayStation, and Xbox, they're they're off, they're obviously uh, a little bit biased in, in their own regards. But Razer has always been kind of, uh, you know, we are for gamers. We are not for Xbox. We are not for PlayStation. We are not for computer. We're for gamers. And uh, if there was ever a bipartisan effort, 
I think Razer is is you know if OSVR is anything to show for it, they're making a a great step. I I can't wait till you guys are you know fully available and people are starting to pour stuff over. When do you think uh, like ever uh, we we mentioned you know five years three or four years in the future. When do you think people are going to start developing you know actively developing on on, on OSVR? And getting games into people's hands, or uh, at least into their eyeballs. Well, um, they're doing it right now. Um, we're um, we're working with tons of game developers that are actually um, working to support OSVR. And even outside the OSVR ecosystem, there are there are tons and tons and tons of indie game developers that are just churning out lots of interesting content from horror from horror games to uh, first-person shooters to adventure games, and and it, it's it's slowly getting there. Um, I mean, if 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 you guys, I mean, when you guys do do go to E3, um, you you would possibly be able to you know try any of the VR headsets, including always VR, and and we have tons of demos to show you guys. Um, and I guess all this is is the precursor to to the big guns, the AAA, the triple A game developers actually coming on board and 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 releasing, uh, um, you know, the, the 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 big titles that 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 um that you know that that that, that they are good at doing. Right, exactly. Well, uh, Javine, uh, uh, Ben, I want to thank you for uh, uh, being with us here tonight. Uh, again, um, uh, we do plan to go out to E3 and, and get some coverage there, and uh, we'll be you know, working along with Pop Sarah and our Gamer Tuesday correspondents uh, will be out there as well. And um, maybe we'll see you out there <laughs> at E3. Definitely. Look for a gentleman named Josh Boykin. We will be sending him specifically to go, you know, find you guys and and, and give us a, a demo and a report. So his name's Josh Boykin. If you remember it in somewhere deep part of your brain, mm-hmm. th- that's our guy. That's our guy. Great. Uh, I'll remember that. All right, <laughs> Uh Listen, thanks again for being with us here tonight on the show, uh, and uh, uh, we're going to continue looking forward to uh, seeing uh, this open source uh, platform. Uh, I can't wait. Yep, true. Exactly. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, thank you again. Take care. Good night. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. All right. So there you go. Uh, open source uh, platform. Um, the, uh, yeah, it, it's it seems like just the thing that virtual reality needs because you you can't lock it behind. Hey, this kind of stuff is only. Uh, this stuff, this kind of stuff, is only available to the AAA titles. This kind of stuff is only relegated to uh, indie developers. Therefore, it's it, it's being marginalized. No, this this kind of hardware, uh, this kind of hardware and software is, especially with the OSVR initiative, it's going to be for everyone. Open source. That's that's the best thing you can have in terms of uh, software, or technology in general. Exactly. Um, okay, well, um, uh, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit, and uh, but we're still talking about gaming. Uh, our next hour guest is going to be... Uh, really, this uh, is the Gamer Tuesday. Uh, we kind of say that uh, our second Tuesday of the month is our Gamer Tuesday. Yep. This is Tuesday, and it's all about gaming. So, our yep. Gamer Tuesday. And uh, a company called Lumoplay is standing by in the wings. Uh, we're going to be bringing them on the show to talk about their technology. Very cool technology. I've watched the, the, uh, the website and the videos. Um, they, they're doing some pretty, uh, uh, I guess, advanced stuff. Uh, that uh, uh, I, I haven't seen a movie n- <laughs> recently about it, but there you go. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very cool technology. I'm going to bring. Ah, we finally found technology that is ahead of the movies. Who yeah, knew? Exactly. All right, coming up in the uh, second hour of the show. Of course, we'll have another news tips poll to review from Marty Winston uh, in the uh, second hour uh, as well. And uh, let's see, do I have a sneak peek as what he's talking about in the second hour? Uh, the uh, the uh, Talent MUS, Muse 3. Talent Muse 3. That's what he's going to be talking about. Uh, that looks interesting. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, also, we have two more winners uh, from our Logitech contest. You know, if you want to get one of those away now, we have a minute or two. Okay. Well, we can do that. All right. Well, let's do it. Then we won't be rushed. All right. This is for the uh, s- uh, second place uh, winner. This is for the Logitech G400S Gaming Mouse. Valid at $60. Very cool technology. It is a corded mouse, uh, super high DPI, um, and, uh, and that prize goes to... The 
Daniel Merkel. Daniel Merkel, congratulations. You won that uh, Logitech G400S gaming mouse, about at 60 bucks. Uh, he listens to us in uh, Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Pewaukee. 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 I've never been to Pewaukee. Have you been to Pewaukee? I've never, I've never even met a person from Pewaukee. No, neither have I, but evidently it's out there, and uh, he listens to Computer American Pewaukee, and he actually has a nice comment for us, too. Uh, remember, the comments are optional, but we, we do get them from this. He says, he says yeah, great. like them. Yeah, he says, great show. He says, when I can't listen live, I play your podcasts. So there you go. So um, he listened to the program, and uh, he entered in the – and he's our second-place winner. So congratulations to you, Daniel Merkel. So that's Jeffrey Morgan uh, for the third-place winner uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, and Daniel Merkel now in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. And we have one more winner coming up on the, uh, on the program, our grand prize winner. That's going to be for the Logitech X300 mobile wireless stereo speaker. About at 70 bucks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all these and fold them into our social media contest. Head over to ComputerAmerica.com and check out our social media. That's all you have to do. It's on every page of our website. You'll see the little charms to the right on the right hand side of the screen. You'll see Google+, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, they're, they're all there. We're doing Facebook and YouTube. Go to Facebook and just like our page, and you're entered. That's all you have to do. Go to YouTube, subscribe to our, our videos, and you're in the drawing. That's how it is. That's how you enter. It's real simple. All right. Uh, you listen to the Computer America program on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the IRN Radio Network, on uh, uh, TuneIn Radio Network. We're going to break just for a short moment, and then we're going to be back with Lumo Play. Stay with us. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into Hour 2 of the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And uh, we continue on. Again, uh, thanks to Razor for being on with us the uh, first hour of the uh, show. Uh, if you missed any portion of that, by the way, uh, just go to our homepage. Go to ComputerAmerica.com. Everything, everything we do um, is on our website. If you go to, as well, there are different pull-down menus there. For example, if you go to Interact uh, or, or News and Blog, uh, under the News and Blog pull-down menu, you'll see the third one says Show Archives. And you just click on that. It'll take you to our Show Archives page. Um, and you can listen to the Computer America show. Uh, you, we have YouTube video archives are up there. We have the iTunes audio archives. So if you go to iTunes, and uh, it'll take you right to the link. Uh, you can do, download any one of our shows either in iTunes or use the web browser uh, to do that as well. Either way, it'll, it'll launch the iTunes application if you want. Uh, Blog Talk Radio, all of our shows, the audio portion are archived there. YouTube, obviously, it's video and audio archived. So all the links are there. Head over to ComputerAmerica.com, and uh, you can... Uh, uh, you know, check it out for yourself, uh, computermarket.com. And while you're there, also um, uh, go to our uh, under about us under syndication, and you can see all the different networks that carry the Computer America show. And the one thing I want to talk about real quickly is the TuneIn Radio Network, where you can listen, but you can also download. They have an app for your iPhone and or for your Android phone. And then when you you do that, then you can listen to Computer America wherever you are. You don't have to be in front of your computer. Uh, the app actually picks up the live audio stream of Computer America. You can search, just search for us on the IRN radio network uh, when you're in TuneIn, and uh, you'll see the, uh, you'll see our show. You can be able to listen to our program right there on your smart device. It's all, everything we do is at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, anything you need about a show, also our calendars are up there. Everything that we do is at ComputerAmerica.com. Okay, um, that said, 
uh, anything else? Let's, uh, otherwise, I'm going to bring on our second hour guest. Who's no, been... I, I, I'm, I'm excited for this next one. Yeah, patiently waiting um, uh, for this. Um, uh, the company uh, is called Lumoplay. Uh, they, they, it's an entirely new kind of toy that turns a floor, the floor, into an interactive play space. Uh, it's, again, it's called Lumoplay. It's an interactive projector specifically designed for multiplayer interactive floor games. Uh, it projects a large play field onto a floor, creating colorful interactive games that get kids moving. Kids, heck, I'd love to do this. Um, created, created over uh, three years by a team of designers, artists, and engineers, it offers the fun and engagement of virtual worlds with the physical movement of traditional playtime. Hmm. Now joining us uh, is the CEO of Lumo Play Incorporated and Pro Motion Incorporator, Meg Atudley. Meg, welcome into the Computer America Show. How are you? You Congratulations on pronouncing my last name correctly. That's awesome. <laughs> it happens so rarely. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, for us, it, it, it doesn't happen often, so... <laughs> Well, I'm just going to call her Meg. Hi, Meg. Totally <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome to the show. So, um, I, again, uh, n tell us a little bit about the company. I mean, how did you come about this this uh, really uh, interesting idea? Um, so our company started pretty organically. Uh, my co-founder, Curtis Walks, and I met making games um, at a design studio several years ago. And we were just really interested. It was before the Kinect was available, um, Instructables and the whole maker movement was just starting. We were just really, really interested in creating interactive environments and um, the ways in which uh, projection technology could be used to transform spaces. So we started out just by um, creating sort of uh, custom R&D solutions for advertising and events. and what ended up happening over time was um, because there was such a small group of us and Curtis was the on only coder originally, um, there was a need to develop tools, like to develop a platform so that I could create the games without having to get Curtis to recode every single time we had to customize. And what ended up happening was we developed this platform that uh, basically is designed so that artists and designers and non-coders can create their own interactive projection games. And that's how Pomotion was born. It's um, been, we commercialized it four years ago. It's been sort of our main source of revenue. And people just go online from agencies and design firms and uh, create these interactive displays. And you might have seen them in malls. They're all over the world. We have about 4,000 active installations worldwide. Wow. And, and what we found from doing that was that kids totally gravitate to those experiences. So um, a couple of years ago, we decided that, you know, probably a, a sensible company would have said, hey, we're making money. Um, we should, you know, grow the original company. But what we said was, well, let's invest the money in making a toy um, because we just saw the value in uh, bringing physical engagement back into play. And there were, I'm a single mom. There's a lot of alarming statistics around how much time kids are spending in front of screens. It's yeah. affecting their social I try to get. I try to get Ben away from that screen, but he's just there all the so time. So hard, right? Like they. I need it. it, it it's it's yeah. not a want at this point. I need it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the the issue with with existing game consoles is that kids are still staring at a screen when they play. They're not really interacting with each other. So what our system does is it allows them to play face to face, and um, one of the sort of unique qualities of interactive projection is because it projects onto any surface, you can actually use things like physical objects as controllers. So you don't need to have, like with the Wiimote, you have to have the little um, Wiimote, Wiimotes. And uh, with the Kinect, you're using your body, but you're basically restrained to sort of standing in a very specific area. Um, with Lumo, you actually jump in the games, and you can use actual physical toys as controllers and as elements in the game. And the projector projects right on the toys, so it brings them to life. Um, you can take a car and set it on fire with projection. It's it's really really cool. Well, okay, so let me understand this. So the the projector there is there for above. It's uh, uh, 
above the uh, uh, so you have to mount it like on a, on the ceiling or something or it mounts to the ceiling or the wall it's really small um the current prototype is about as big as this <laughs> um, and the, okay. yeah it's going to be it's going to be the size of a softball when uh, we're complete like when okay. the the product goes to market and it just has a little wall mounting bracket that you put on the wall or the ceiling that slides on and has a safety latch so kids can't pull it down all right, so so it's going to project downward. So yeah. I, I guess my question is, if it's projecting downwards and the and a child is standing, you know, on the surface of it, isn't isn't going the projection going to be uh, the uh, what's then, on? Yes, you have to start. Uh, you, you have to start dancing and kicking and hitting the back of that child's head. It, it's, it's what <laughs> it is. Yeah. So what ends up happening is, if you look at the videos, the projection actually doesn't project straight down. It's at an angle. Um, and it's designed to be up against a wall. So there is, for sure, their their shadows are something that we have to take into account when designing these games, and that's unique to projection. It's not something you have to deal with with tablet games. Um, and it's part of our, our software development kit is a whole design guide on how to design your games so that shadows are not an issue. Uh, but we designed Lumo so that the shadows always fall behind the players. Um, if you're watching the games, a yeah, lot of times showing, you still notice the shadows. But we're showing it right now. Uh, if you're watching, yeah. then you can see the actual video. Go ahead. Yeah, so the the shadows will fall behind the players as they're playing, and um, we do everything that we can to uh, create the the game creation tools that we're using to make new games. Walk people through um, where you should put your controls, where you should put your assets. If you're kicking a ball back and forth, you need the players to intuitively stand in certain places. Um, and because we've had so much experience doing this in a commercial environment, we've got you know, a very, very refined way of designing games where shadows don't become an issue. Yeah, I'm watching it now, and uh, boy, the kids really are enthusiastic about that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they can't get enough of it. Yeah, they, uh, it it's yeah, actually... Watch. The challenge we had was designing it so it was big enough that they don't accidentally kick each other. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we actually had to do tons of playtesting in people's homes and uh, in you know children's museums and stuff to to figure out exactly what the ideal size was. And so Lumo's designed to support players up to four players at a time. It will track more people than that, but the games themselves are designed to have up to four players and. Um, that's just like the perfect size and the perfect number that they all have enough space to play. How big square footage? How big is the the the, the ideal projection on the floor? How how many? You guys are Americans, so we have to do feet here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the projector itself is the ideal height mounting height is between eight and ten feet, and it has a projector throw ratio of one to one, which basically means that from eight feet from the ground, there's an eight foot diagonal throw. Um, the, I, the, basically the, the range is around um, six foot by, uh, four feet by six feet is like the minimum size, and then it gets a little bit bigger as you raise it up. Okay, so now do you, uh, do you have um, um, some sort of a c adjustment? I mean, is there, is there like a focus knob on it? So you, you so yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, hand focuses, there are projector modules coming on the market right now um, that are laser projectors. Getting a laser projector approved for use with kids is a little bit tricky, so it's going to be a year or so before we can like use those kinds of modules. Once we, probably the second or third generation will have laser modules in there and they'll be auto focusing. I mean, with lasers you don't have to worry about focusing, they're always in focus from whatever distance. Um, but currently, yeah, we have like a, just a focus mod, a focus wheel. Can you get a little closer to your mic? Uh, we're having some people saying they're having a little difficulty in hearing what you're saying. I hear you fine, but... You I know, can shout too if you want. That's, but, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. better. Actually. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's good. No, I think that's better. All right, so now again, this is primarily for projection on the floor, although I'm seeing some of the things in the movie, uh, in the video, that it's showing it's projecting on the wall too. Yeah. Is, um, yeah, so the way that we designed Lumo, I, I wanted to make a projector that could also do all the things that a projector can do. Uh, we focused on the floor games because it's part of our mandate to get kids active again, and it's a lot easier to get them to move a lot if the game is on the floor, but you can also swivel 
Lumo project on the on the wall and use it as a regular projector. So you can use it to watch movies. Um, every it's it's built on the Android platform, so every existing Android uh, game can be played using a Bluetooth controller. Um, so it kind of anything you can do with a regular projector, uh, you can do with Lumo. And then on top of that, it also does the floor games. Okay. Um, do, does it come with a, a variety or assortment of games? Uh, yeah. Um, we just finished our Indiegogo campaign. Um, we're still taking orders, but we raised, we we hit our funding goal. Um, the people that back us on Indiegogo get the launch, the first launch with a hundred games. Um, so we're including a hundred games in effects with the with the Lumo that goes out to early stage backers, and we also have template tools so they can make their own games. Ultimately, this is going to be offered on a subscription-based model, so parents will pay a monthly or annual fee to give their kids access to make as many games as they want to. Um, but anybody that gets on board early will be able to make as ga many games as they want in the first year. So, um, And the publishing tools are a little bit different than what other companies offer. They're, it's not an SDK. It's not designed for software developers. It's designed really for kids around seven years and up. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step template tool. So they, they say, I want to make a hockey game, and then they get to draw their own rink and draw their own puck, draw their own nets, and basically make and publish their own game with their own artwork. I, I, I was about to say, have you guys really come that far where, you know, seven-year-olds you know, seven uh, can start making, not playing, not playing games by themselves, but start creating their own games? Um, yeah, we have tools online right now that uh, we've tested with kids. They, they were primarily designed for advertisers initially. Um, and the platform that we have now uh, allows kids to edit existing templates. So they can choose, um, you know, some of the, the templates include hockey and soccer. Um, some of them are like things like the fish pond and stuff. They can choose the, the template. Yeah, this is a really good example. Uh, they can draw assets and then they can publish the game to their unit. Uh, what we want to add, what we're missing right now that we want to add in the next few months is an asset library. So we want to be able to give kids the ability to save graphics they've made and also to pull from an existing asset library because I think that's what's going to make it um, a lot easier for younger children to use. Uh, there's The drawing tools themselves are like basic drawing tools like you would find in a children's drawing app. Um, but what really makes the game come to life is being able to add things like animations and stuff. And animation tools are a little trickier to do with younger children. So we want to give them existing animations um, to work with so that they can kind of build their game up with things that are already moving and already have sort of a compelling story behind them. Is there any kind of a, a minimum requirement for the surface onto which you're you to project these images? I mean, I got we have one. Not a black floor. <laughs> not a black floor. Nor, yeah. I, I would think not not either a mirror or glass either, right? It would has to be. It has to be. Uh, I've never uh, seen a mirrored floor before, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you probably wouldn't. You probably wouldn't want that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's designed to uh, work really well. It works really well on hardwood floors. Um, low pile light carpeting and uh, what we use when we demo is um, interlocking foam floor tiles and I highly recommend them. You can get them for $20 on Amazon oh, yes, and yeah. what's, you know, what's amazing about them is they cut down the noise. Um, like you are putting something in your home that's going to make your children jump up and down on the floor. Uh, so if you invest in a $20 set of floor tiles, it actually will make you very happy in the end. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and and uh, as you say, and also when they're, you're you're pounding on it like that, I guess it's a little easier on the feet, I would think too. Yeah, absolutely. I, although kids yes. are pretty bouncy. So. Yeah, but um, but I'm seeing, like, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of adults playing this in all these videos. I'm seeing you. you yeah. I think uh, and, and you know I, I didn't do any any of the research behind that video, but it looked like you took it to the second best market for this kind of thing, which was uh, patrons after bar hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean the thing is with uh, with bars and with advertising. So I mean we're looking sort of at more a long term picture when it comes to this company. Um, we've already got our foot in the retail and commercial market with the software platform that we launched several years ago, and we actually did sit down around the table and say, hey, you know we're ready to build a turnkey hardware solution. Should we build something for the commercial vertical? Um, or should we build something for uh, for children at home? 
and there was nothing. There's nothing like this on the market for the home. But the other reason that we sort of uh, strayed away from targeting um, targeting you know older people and bars was the content. <laughs> the content. Uh, kids get bored faster. So just from a business standpoint, strategically, it makes a lot of sense to put this in the hands of somebody that's going to want a lot of different games and want to make their own content, as opposed to putting it in a bar where, like, we have a lot of installations in bars and malls all over the world, and on average, they might change the content seasonally um, and, you know, put their logo on things a few times, but they're not going to go through games. They're, they're not avid game consumers the way that small children are. Um, and... I mean, this has such a huge application in the education market um, and such huge uh, impact on children who have special needs or mobility issues or maybe can't play outside um, as often as, as they should that we just like felt that this was just a stronger market in the long run. So uh, we've been focusing on kids, but yeah, you're right. I mean, adults absolutely love it. And it's like, it really is a whole home gaming solution. It's something that very small children can enjoy all the way up to like, you know, you could have it in, in a game room and have, we have drinking games on it in the office. So, <laughs> um, we're Canadian, so beer pong is really big here. <laughs> and like <laughs> <laughs> That actually sounds pretty fun. And, and uh, but, and one thing about the, the, the whole aspect with kids though, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm just watching all these videos with these kids are, you know, using real life interactive, objects like, like uh, sometimes they have yeah. cars sometimes they're making like are there games where you're you're supposed to you know maybe make a paper airplane and then you make a game around that yeah um, we are developing a bunch of different solutions around using actual objects um, as controllers and uh, right now the way that the technology works in tracking toys is pretty rudimentary. So the, the toys that you see, like the fishing rod that's in that video, I got it at a dollar store and we just outfitted oh. it with a special blinking light. Um, so it's it doesn't cost a lot to make controllers for, for the games and ultimately the vision of the company is to allow children to take their existing toys and turn them into controllers. So when they're making, in the process of making the game, um, they can either add a sticker or add a light or take a picture of the toy they want to use as a controller and add it into the game they're going to publish. And this has huge applications, not just as a, a controller, but you know, say your child builds a castle out of Lego and they want to put a moat around it and stick sharks in it. Um, oh, this was a, the video you're showing right now was an April Fool's joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was excited for a second. I was like, yes, yes, one for your fish, finally. <laughs> Neglected fish, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you, you know it's it's interesting because um, uh, the I I see like you have word games in other words you know which which I you know I guess you could even just sort of like a, a type of a Scrabble or something I mean you could I yeah, mean bingo has never been easier really I mean, you you could do word <laughs> games with this right uh, yeah you can do word games you can do multiple choice um, you can do we have a few math games. Um, we in our previous platform we had a lot of language development games that were actually um, because we launched the platform and people from all over the world just started making whatever they needed with it we were able to track what it was being used for most often and there was a pretty even split between advertising and education there were a lot of people overseas that were developing like alphabet tiles where if a child stepped on a, a letter it said you know a word that started with that letter and they would have to repeat it back um, Lumo comes equipped with uh, with speakers, um, so the first generation one uh, it has like audio, it has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, um, and kids can hear things when they like there's sound reactions when they do stuff. So what's what's awesome about that is like in the toy controller ones, um, when the car is is being hit by things, there's actual explosion sounds, and when it blows up, there's a nice big sound, and uh, that whole element really adds to the quality of bringing something to life. Now, again, you know, I'm envisioning something here. You know, you take an average, you know, uh, uh, card table, a, a, rec, uh, a square card table, coffee mm -hmm. table, a card table, or a game table. Which would it's, you could have this, and then you could have the projector over the game table, projecting down onto it, and yeah. then you could be playing, you know, some sort of table game. 
you know, rather than a floor game, you could all be sitting, uh, you know, in your four chairs, and you have up to four people playing this. You could have a, you could play it on the table, could you not? Yeah, you could. You could even um, track actual cards. You know, you could have a special deck of cards where you're using physical cards, but it's adding reactions. Uh, another thing, when we release the SDK, we have like uh, surveys that go out asking people what they're planning to develop for it, and card and table games is really high on the list. And another thing that um, has come up quite a bit is we get a lot of dungeon masters and people that play role-playing games that want to mm. be able to have an interactive map for their games. Good so, use, good use. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Lumo can totally be applied that way. And I'm, we're a fairly small team, and we needed to focus on one thing that we were really passionate about. But uh, we we fully expect this unit to be used for all kinds of things. Nobody's ever really done... The biggest challenge was making this affordable. Nobody has ever really made a tiny little unit that could be put in a home. Um, and the development kit is super simple. The motion, adding motion reaction is super simple. Existing tablet games um, on Android can be ported to the system really, really easily. So that's like thousands of games that can immediately be added to the system. And definitely not all of them are aimed at children. Uh, yeah, a comment in the chat room about tabletop role-playing games. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think you just kind of answered that, didn't you? I can well, answer it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. Well, yeah, no, I'm sure they got it the first time. But uh, in my limited experience of playing tabletop games, you you do have maps and you have dungeons and it, and, and something like this. It, it would be like I get that you guys are focusing really on education and that you came from an advertising background. But uh, I guess you're right. You know, no one's ever had really like not that they don't want something like this in their home it's just they never really had the opportunity to have something like it this it was expensive it was like thousands of dollars up until a year ago so. and and so small i mean this thing is yeah. so tiny. it's mean, adorable right it's it's so cute <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm biased so, but <laughs> softball size is not a lie yeah yeah no. it's really tiny Oh, is that the prototype that we're looking at right now, or is that the actual gonna be the size of the actual product? That's, that's just... going to be the size of the actual products. Right. Okay. So again, very very easy. Uh, it looks fairly lightweight too, so you don't you need a huge clamp or something on the wall. You have some sort of a uh, wall mount. I mean, an actual picture frame kind of wall mount. It's just a What's little bracket. What's it? Um, the the whole unit. It's yeah. just under two pounds. Okay. Well, then that's you know obviously. Yeah. You so can I... put it in a purse and carry it with you. A picture. Um, now, what is what? Obviously, if you're hanging on the wall, you need a power store. So you need some sort of an electrical outlet or something for the. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, a lot, and you do. You see a lot of those now. You know, where people hang picture frames. You know, they they want a light for it, so they'll have the, the socket up halfway up the wall, so you could use that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we are also working on an adapter, so you can plug it into a light socket. Uh, initially, we wanted to make the unit plug into a light socket, but when we started doing user testing, um, a lot of newer homes don't have light sockets in the ceiling, so we decided that that was probably going to limit where we could put it. Um, so what happens now is it comes with an external power brick, and um, we're supplying power supplies for global voltages because for some reason the world can't agree on... <laughs> <laughs> On one power cable, so uh, that that gives us the opportunity to kind of like make it um, affordably available worldwide right away. Um, and uh, we're also working on an external battery pack. Um, the projector already runs on a battery. We're just looking at adding uh, a driver so that we'll we'll be able to run the uh, the Android processor on a on a battery as well. So. Well, uh, the battery, I can understand the process, but the light would, would, would probably drain a battery in a few moments. Or, I mean, no, uh, it actually runs for the length of a movie right now. Really? Um, yeah, so it's like an hour and a half to two hours you can get on a wow. battery. Yeah, it's, well, what, batteries are amazing now. The, the, well, or the light source, is it LED, what kind of light? Is it LED lighting? What are you yeah. using for the light? Yeah, it's an LED module. Um, it's okay. marketed as 120 lumens, which means it's around 100 lumens because... Oh. That's just how the, <laughs> that's how the projector companies do it. Um, so it's it's designed to be used, and we get a lot of, of people contacting us about using it as a di digital signage. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Jack in the, in the chat room wants to know if he could put up a Halloween scene on his house. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no, you can. Um, as it, it really comes down to ambient light. So if you picture what your living room looks like with the lights inside off and the blinds drawn. Um, it doesn't have to be pitch black, but you definitely don't want super high ambient light. 
Um, so the answer to his question is yes, but at night. Um, you can yeah. do something on your house. Uh, and we also, just in case you're interested, we also have tutorials on how to make your house spooky with our current interactive projection software. So ah. um, he can reach out to me and I can point him to that if he's interested. So ja Jack's a sharp guy. He kind of anticipated that. <laughs> uh, okay, so so basically, uh, when you the intention is when you purchase the unit, it's going to come with a, a variety of games. Do you plan to do you, do you do you foresee selling additional add-on games that people can download? I mean, where where are the games stored in the? Uh, unit? We have a market. It's pretty much exactly the same as uh, as. You know, and the Android Play Market or the uh, the Apple Market um, will have a game market where people can go and choose games as they as they want them, and they get pushed directly to the unit. When you get when you go and buy Lumo, um, it comes loaded with games, and then you go online and register the unit, and there's an app market that you can choose new games from and just send them to your to your unit. Uh, the library and um, and menu system is all on the floor, so children don't have to touch the unit in order to change games. Yeah. Um, so that's that's actually really nice too. It was a, it was kind of a, a difficult problem to solve because when you think about it, projecting a menu on the floor and having kids, you know, it's like a multiple choice thing. And having kids step on the game they want, that's not very hard. But when they're in gameplay, figuring out how to get them back to the menu system without, in a way that they wouldn't accidentally trigger, um, was like surprisingly challenging and the solution was really like in the end in retrospect it was really obvious what happens is they have to they have to stop playing so when they stop playing for a certain amount of time it gives them the option to keep playing or to go back to the menu system but very, it took a while it took a while of playtesting to come up with the solution so <laughs> very clever all right we're at the uh, bottom of the hour Meg and uh, we're going to uh, take a break and then we'll continue on uh, Ben and I are talking to uh, Meg a tablet, who is the uh, CEO of LumoPlay. We're talking about the LumoPlay projector. Uh, we also have another Logitech winner of the week, and also a show remind no, a uh, a new stuff bolter interview. From there Martin. you go. Brand new one coming up too. Stay with us. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door-to-door, -door, neighborhood by neighborhood, to educate citizens about local resources available for at-risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community-based approach to no no Kill helps keep family pets healthy, happy, and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place. For more information or to make a tax-deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization, visit their website at www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Let's do this. This is Marty Winston with a news tips bullet review for Computer America. This time, the Talent MUS3 stand. The Talent brand is exclusively distributed in the U.S. by Arts Express, who honored our request for the Talent MUS3 stand. 
stand by because this is about to take two for each turn. The first, the MUS-3 is a sheet music stand and not a new invention. It's like the ones you may have seen on a Philharmonic stage or in a school band room. It has a telescoping dual shaft adjustment for height and a rear tightening adjustment for tilt, but it's basically 20 inches wide of sh uh, steel with an L bottom if, if it's on its stand on a Y-shaped base. We didn't want it for sheet music. Rethinking workspaces, we took a look at the phones on our desk and thought well, what we might be able to do to make them take less space but be more accessible. So we figured on a right angle mount using a wall mount for the phone, but it looked familiar. It made us think of music stands and we found the right stability in the Talent MUS 3. We could fit three of the instruments we currently use, but decided instead on a slightly wider model with a bigger display and bigger buttons in case we ever get old. The uh, whole assembly also had to take advantage of four clock modules because we heard that Windows 10 doesn't support gadgets and you keep a clock on, sp on screen for each of the US time zones. So we put the whole thing together, a strip of vinyl tape silenced the uh, rattling of the concentric vertical strut in the stand and plastic project boxes covered the wiring in the back, bottom line. The Talent MUS-3 stand from Parts Express is great for sheet music, but even sweeter when we try to make the workplace neater. This is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bullet Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Uh, yeah, uh, before we get back to Luma Play and Meg, uh, we have to, uh, or at least we, we get to, I'm sorry, not have to, we get to, we get to announce our uh, our grand uh, our grand winner want, of that contest. You want to do it right now? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, then let's do so this. is for the grand prize. This is for the Logitech X300 mobile wireless stereo speaker. And uh, you get to pick the color. That's my understanding. That is $70. And that prize goes to... Nancy Parent. <laughs> Nancy Parent, congratulations. Uh, Nancy listens to us in Lake Wales, Florida. Oh, I like Lake Wales. Lake Wales. I, w I went to camp in Lake Wales many, many moons ago. I really? To, yeah. I hear they're much smaller than their ocean whale cousins. Oh, but a boom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, no, the, uh, uh, I remember Lake Wales, and the, the one thing that I remember most about it is that it, ha it had a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> and, uh, boy, at night well, time, this is Florida. Yeah, yeah, but especially Lake Wales. Uh, yeah, but uh, on top of that, I also remember Spook Hill. To this day, I still don't understand Spook Hill. I, I have to go back and, as an adult and, and look at that thing. Basically, it's like a valley. You go into it, you put your car in neutral, and your car rolls backwards up the hill, back to the top of it. No explanation for it. We did it in a bus, and it did it too. It's called Spook Hill, and it's in Lake Wales, Florida. We got, i, I got to go visit that again. Mm. Yeah, I know. It's, it's amazing. Seems, seems like a parlor trick. They probably just had some guy with a rope and no. just pulled yeah. you back up the hill. <laughs> Yeah. Real slow. Yeah, no, it's there. It's the spook hill. Anyway, uh, congratulations to Nancy Parent. So that's all three of our guests. Uh, Jeffrey Morgan in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, wins the uh, Logitech HD Webcam C310, valued at fifty dollars, third place prize. Uh, Daniel Merkel wins the Logitech G400S gaming mouse, and that at sixty dollars, the second prize. Prize and Nancy Parent, uh, our grand prize winner, winning the Logitech X300 mobile wireless stereo speaker, valued at seventy dollars. So congratulations to all of you. And um, as I said, we're going to start the, the contest again, but we're taking these prizes and rolling them into our social media uh, contest that we give yeah. away. And so, yeah, for sure. And also, apparently, uh, in in the chat room, uh, Lake Wales is getting some some love there too. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's all good. Okay. Anyhow, uh, we uh, right now uh, Ben and I are we're talking to a Lumo Play, uh, Meg Atavle, who is the uh, CEO of. Okay. Wait. Before the show ends, I have to try this. A tuvle. No, tavle. A, a tavle. Yes. Right, Meg? <laughs> yes, that's right. A My dad okay. will be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> CEO of Lumo Play, and we're talking about the, the, the Lumo Play interactive projector. Oh, um, and and uh, we actually had a question in the chat room right before the break that uh, we kind of want to get in here. Uh, 
I get that you can make games for this thing, and it's very, very easy, and that's going to be awesome and a great feature. But admittedly, our audience skews uh, a little bit older, maybe the ones buying, the, you know, buying these things for their kids, and they all have questions about what else you could do, uh, what else you could do with the Lumo. And the latest one was, uh, could you turn it into kind of a touch surface uh, for your phone? Um, yes, you could. Uh, I think it depends on how you interpret that, but if you wanted to use it as a display for your phone and use your phone as the touch surface um, to control elements, we're actually implementing that as part of our SDK, so somewhere in the next year we'll be publishing tools so that you can use mobile devices in conjunction with the phone, and the way that we picture that being used is like a sort of versus game, so you have one person controlling things on the phone and other people engaging on the projection surface. Mm. Um, if you wanted to use the the projection itself as a touch surface, um, there's a couple different ways that we can do that and uh, I, I kind of expect that our developer community is going to end up launching a lot of this stuff before we do because we're focused mainly on the education market. Um, but one really great idea is uh, putting a light onto your hands that you can use that goes on when you touch the surface um, because when you think about it when you're projecting on the floor there is no touch event it can see you moving it can see you triggering um, objects with gestures but there's no without a capacitive um, surface or something that uh, would be incredibly expensive to implement there's no way to actually tell when your foot or hand has actually touched the surface um, so using a light to trigger that event uh, would be totally totally feasible. Um, using your phone to trigger that event is totally feasible and also um, it's Bluetooth enabled so we're experimenting a little bit with Bluetooth devices um, not just for touch events but also just for location tracking. Um, so there's like there's really no no limit to what you can do with the with the device and we try to keep it as open as possible because we realize there's a much wider market like there's a, a a lot of really, really cool ideas that have been coming in from our developer community. So we'll be supporting all of them. Well, this begs the question, um, when it comes to accuracy, I mean, <laughs> sometimes games it doesn't matter, you know, you can't, but you know, uh, when you're doing something and you know you kicked the ball or you knew you selected it and it, and it didn't pick up on it, you you, you, go, you could scream. Super foul. frustrating, yeah. yeah. So how, ac I mean, how accurate? How, how close are we to virtual Jenga? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I have a funny Jenga story, um, but it's probably not appropriate for radio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, actually, Jenga is a little bit a little bit difficult because it's like a stacking game, and we're projecting on the floor. But um, we get asked about Twister all the time. Wow. And Twister is a really good example of a game that would where shadows would cause a crazy issue. So we're looking at a Twister game where the the um, things that you're supposed to touch actually move away from you. Uh, so it like forces you to keep moving as opposed to just holding a pose, um, mm. and that's been pretty fun. Um, the uh, the accuracy is being improved dramatically, especially this year. So one of the big things that happened with our company this year was we got some funding from the Canadian government to bring on two new engineers who are focused on the game development and the um, the refining of the algorithm. The existing system that we've launched, the promotion system, just does frame differencing. So it basically just sees, like, if you have something here and it moves over here, it sees that it's moved. Mm. Um, what Lumo is going to have is predictive algorithms. So not only will you see that something moved in a certain direction, but what speed it's going and what, like, like where it's going to stop. So when you're kicking um, something like a soccer ball around, it'll actually have really, really good uh, physics and the right now the accuracy is on par with the commercial systems it's uh it's really really fast so there's not really like a latency issue or anything um but i remember playing you you had mentioned the early connect games and like how they sort of were more novelty based um that that the quality of play like that suspension of disbelief that you're actually standing inside a game is really really important to us so um we're working towards really good accuracy but right now it's like as good as it gets so well, the the the, uh, the algorithms you mentioned is it sounds like they're almost like velocity sensing, and if they are, I mean, if you if you're doing a hard kick as opposed to a gentle kick, uh, that would be reflected in how the the ball would it, move. It, that would exactly, be reflected yeah. in, in how loud the other person screams when they're kicked. 
Well, also, <laughs> I mean, it impacts sound effects and stuff. Like, mm. um, so, you know, you want to make the sound effects louder so that when you kick the other person, you can still hear the ball bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and again, uh, again, I have to ask this question. I mean, um, when you're kicking anything and you're so close together, and, and can that open? Up? We, we saw a few accents in the videos that we were just watching, uh, but between the kids, but yep. uh, they they seem to handle it pretty well. They bounce off each other sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, like a lot of it is trial and error, and um, we, like I said, we've been doing this for like. A longer than I care to think about. <laughs> We've been doing it for a really long time, and uh, and I mean, really, like I'll tell you the story of our worst accident because it actually had nothing to do with kids bumping into each other because they do that when they're naturally playing, anyways. I mean, if they were playing with a real soccer ball, they would still be kicking each other sometimes. Sure. Okay. Um, the uh, but they, you know, with with a Lumo soccer ball, they're not going to also knock down the furniture, so there's a bit of an advantage there. Mm -hmm. um, but the worst accident that we've ever had testing this stuff was actually um, the very, very, very first time we ever installed an interactive floor. It was a test we were doing in my garage, and uh, this was many years ago, about seven years ago, and we had a whole bunch of people over and we were showing off our extremely ridiculously scaled back motion algorithms mm -hmm. and um, the projector we were using came from a pawn shop it was like a borrowed projector and oh. yeah it was like we you know this was before we started a company it was something we were just playing around with in our spare time and we didn't check to see if the projector was uh, made to be pointed down. So halfway through the test, the bulb exploded. Oh. <laughs> so, so actually, like, the, the danger of kids sort of bouncing off of each other is it pales in comparison to the danger of hardware failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've learned an awful lot about what kinds of um, projectors and, can be used. And that kind of projector probably didn't use the halogen bulb of some sort. It probably didn't use LED bulbs. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of what makes Lumo possible now, where it wasn't possible two years ago, is the LED modules, the advancements in LED um, technology technology uh, have made it possible not only to create projectors that don't have a lot, they don't kick off a lot of heat, so they can put, be put safely exactly. in the home. Exactly. Yeah, the it, bulbs last 40,000 hours, too. Yeah, and long, I mean, they, 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 they do. I mean, I mean that they have automobile headlights now that are LEDs, I and mean, the, the, yeah. the power of an, they, they, they have ways of, of, of projecting, you know, thousands of lumens with, uh, with LED bulbs. They have LED flashlights, you know, are, are so yeah. incredibly bright now. And and, and the camp campers with them are up so obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. and, and using a fraction of the power I mean, that that yeah. was required. I mean, you 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 had an incandescent bulb with that kind of power, your battery would last like three minutes. You know, so yeah. so obviously uh, the 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 tech the technology has improved enormously with LED technology, as you mentioned, and uh, uh, and so uh, and that's only going to continue to improve. Absolutely, uh, yeah. and the laser modules are really incredible. We saw a few of them at CES this year, and like the idea of having something that's always in focus, no matter what distance you put it at, is mm -hmm. phenomenal. So yeah, uh, it, almost like an infinite depth of field. Uh, exactly, which you have there. Yeah, so uh, it always remaining in focus. Um, it doesn't require any fine tuning, I guess, when you have it up there trying to 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 do it because you have that ability with 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 it. Um, so you you. Is the is the product here yet, or is it is it just about ready to be uh, sold? How far are you away from actually bringing this product to market? We're in pre-sale. Um, we expect to ship our dev kits in December at the latest. Uh, we're aiming for November, but we're kind of giving it a, a one-month window. Mm -hmm. um, so the dev kits go out before Christmas, and then the initially when we launched the Indiegogo campaign, we were expecting to deliver the first batch of commercial units in um, June. And that's been pushed up to April, uh, just because we've been moving so quickly. So it's uh, it's going to be like early next year. We'll start shipping the first sort of wave of early adopter units, and then we're hoping to have um, the unit available, you know, through online platforms like Amazon by the end of next year. So the aim right now is to uh, do our first big factory run before Christmas of next year. What kind of a uh, um response that you get from Indiegogo? I mean, it was really good. I mean, like one of the things that we we try we had tried to run a Kickstarter when we first thought of this idea just to do some market testing and even that the response was much bigger than we expected it to be. Um, but the price point at that point was really really high. Um, the Indiegogo campaign considering like we didn't really put 
any money behind the marketing. We just kind of launched it organically, uh, set the goal at a reasonable level so that we could get it to the manufacturing. Like the all of the funds that we collected are are going to be used to complete the design for manufacturing. Um, I think when people launch hardware projects on platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, uh, what you need to realize is you can't do a full factory run with you know hundred thousand dollars or even half a million dollars. A lot of the time, you need um, other methods of funding, and our company has a another revenue stream coming in from the commercial side, so that we've been using that to fund the whole project. We don't have investors or anything, which is kind of an, a nice situation to be in. Um, and uh, and so right now um, we're kind of like we're funding it on that level, and we expect to hit the market fairly early. But the the timeline could be shifted up depending on we're in a lot of really interesting negotiations with people that are are interested in helping with the manufacturing process. Um, so that could change, and it won't get it won't be later, but it could be a bit sooner. And you're going to come out this under your own label. You you haven't brought in some big toy company like Mattel or something along those lines? No, I mean, we've had interest and there's definitely, like, there's pros and cons in working with a, a bigger a bigger company. And one of the things that's really attractive to us is we came at this development as software developers um, and our interest is really in providing the platform and the resources for other people to make crazy cool stuff. Uh, the hardware part of it We've learned how to do, and we uh, we went through an incubator called Highway One last year. They're an amazing uh, group of partners, and they um, provide a lot of resources to. Like they actually took us out to China, and and we we learned a lot on the ground in China, and toured factories, and were able to source all our components and bring the price down significantly um, in as part of that program, and so. We, we're basically sitting at a really interesting crossroads where we can either take this project to market ourselves um, or we can partner with a, a larger company. And some of the pros of par partnering with a larger company include we get to focus on what we were really good at and what we started doing in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and also it brings the price down for the consumer significantly. So that's like not something to overlook. If mm -hmm. if we partner with a company that already has a manufacturing line and you know retail yeah. distribution channels, that actually makes the, the product a lot less expensive. So we're kind of weighing our options right now. We're in some really, really interesting conversations. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, and and I guess we'd be remiss if, if you guys come here and we kind of talk all about uh, Lumo and all around Lumo, but as you've said multiple times here that your your main focus is on education. How has the response been in, I, I'm assuming this is going into uh, either daycare or uh, like lower lower level classrooms? We're aiming primarily for kids under um, under seven years old for starters. The the response from special needs educators in particular has been huge. Um, it, they're always looking for resources that will help engage kids with you know sensory issues or mobility issues. Um, but the the way that this system works with children in particular who have autism uh, is really unique. That kids with and I'm just sort of learning this as I go. I'm certainly not an expert in. Um, in education or in uh, special needs classrooms or anything like that, but uh, we do demos all the time, and we're actually open to doing demos every time. We travel all over North America, so if somebody wanted us to come give a demo at their event or school, um, we do that on a regular basis, and they just have to reach out to us through the contact form on our site. Um, but yeah, we found that the response in special needs classrooms has been particularly uh, strong because Kids tend to gravitate, especially kids with, um, you know, difficulty socializing. They tend to gravitate towards tablets and computers. And the danger in that is, you know, while it may teach them really important skills, and there's a lot of really good educational content for those platforms, it doesn't teach them to socialize with other kids. Whereas Lumo actually has them engaging with each other. So. Um, that's just been a really interesting outcome. It wasn't actually the education angle was something I was personally interested in, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't like we aimed for that in the beginning. It just ended up being the uh, the strongest market in terms of what they were willing to pay, what the need was. I mean, it addresses a huge need in that market. Kids are addicted to screens, so yeah, it seems that way. Um, so the price again, the uh, price is going to be uh, when it comes out. It's going to be how much you're asking for it? 
So right now it's $4.99, um, and when it comes, uh, when it hits like mass mass retail, our our target price point is uh, somewhere between $1.99 and $2.99. Um, and again, that just depends on whether we partner with a big toy company um, and how many we're selling at that time. So uh, the factory, the cost of a factory run is significantly different if you're running 10,000 versus you know 100,000. So. Sure, exactly. Well. <laughs> Well, uh, um, I mean, one way to look at it is it's basically the same price as a projector, but way cooler. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, real quick, and, and you said that there there was that uh, there's a small monthly fee for creating as many games as you want. Uh, is there any kind of I, I don't want to say a marketplace because you know that makes you know transactions, but <laughs> is there anywhere that people can kind of share their creations? It, that's a really tricky question, actually. It's interesting because we put a lot of thought into that. Um, because our, our like our, our market right now is uh, aimed at children, so the game creation tools are aimed at children, we have to look into moderation tools. Uh, kids will be able to share games with their families and with friends on their network. Um, but in terms of publishing their games to the marketplace for sale, we're probably going to put a bit of a limitation on that just because we want to make sure that kids are being delivered appropriate content. Um, we're looking right now at splitting the marketplace, so uh, similar to Netflix, having a children's marketplace and sort of an open marketplace uh, where developers and um, registered publishers can publish their work and it, it doesn't have as heavy a moderation. Um, but yeah, we, we're definitely trying to provide an open marketplace so that not only can developers publish games, but people that are using the content creation tools who, you know, may be designing really cool art assets for existing templates can publish their content. Right, exactly. That's really uh, important for teachers because if they build a game around a curriculum um, subject, they can share it with other schools. Mm -hmm. Well, Meg, uh, look, this is a very cool product, and uh, I, I can't wait to see it actually come out. I'm sure you're, you're, you you feel the same way, obviously. Um, uh, it's not going to be for this Christmas, but certainly for next Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's right. But if you want to get on board developing and have, like, probably the coolest thing in the world for this <laughs> Christmas, uh, yeah. you can pick up a dev kit from our website. There it is. And, and again, that's going to cost... Uh, the dev how? kits are a bit more. They're $5.99. Yes. Um, and they come with like everything. I, it's a huge long list. It's probably better to just go to the site and, and check it out. But yeah, like basically if you get a dev kit, you'll be a rock star in the marketplace by the time we launch. Uh, I would think so. Well, uh, Ben, I want to thank you for being with us here tonight. Uh, I'm, uh, definitely looking forward to it. And uh, um, I think you have something that's uh, really uh, cutting edge. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and best of luck to you with it. And uh, Thank you so much for being with us here on uh, Computer America tonight. You're welcome. All right. You take Thanks care. Good. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. And there she goes. Okay. Uh, Meg. I mean, you, on top of <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. We've been around. We we talked to the you know people in the marketplace and we've, you know, we do this five five nights a week, although this week four nights a week. Uh, but we do this a lot. I, you know, we've seen projectors come and go. We've seen Kinect sensors come and go. We've seen game consoles come and go. Yeah. But this is the first time we've we've seen something like this. Like we've seen this uh, in in demonstrations. We've seen this in, in different settings. But this is the first time we've seen one that's meant to engage kids with a touch sensitive sensor. That's that, that's something we haven't seen before. So uh, it, it, it's sometimes it's hard to come up with a new idea. And I'm glad that they're getting such interest in, in this because it's it's it, it really is novel. Yeah, it's it is novel. It's like, and again, the kids, but also I I can see you know adults you know with with, with and with, yes, for anyone wondering who is listening to the radio show but is not watching the video, they have a built-in game that turns the floor to lava. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 exists within yes. the loom. Yeah, mm -hmm. because who, because really, who hasn't played the game where the floor is lava? Yeah, <laughs> you have to take the throw pillows, throw them on the ground, jump on them, and just dishevel the entire area. No, not anymore. Now you can use Lumo and you know save the couch. And it's a full color projector, so it's all in color. That that lava glows red. You know that too. That too exactly. 
Well, uh, I, again, I want to thank our, our, our guest uh, uh, for being with us here tonight and also congratulate our winners again, uh, Jeffrey Morgan from Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, third place winner Daniel Merkel from Pewaukee, Wisconsin, our second place winner, and Nancy Parent from Lake Wales, Florida, our grand prize winner. Thanks to uh, all of you for playing our contests. And again, our contests are going to continue on. They're just going to be a social media contest. Uh, and again, just go to computeramerica.com and you'll see any the charms on any uh, the right side of any of our pages. Uh, just go to our Facebook page, like it, uh, go to the YouTube page, subscribe to the YouTube feed. That's all you have to do, and it's done. And from then out, you are in our drawing to win some really, really great prizes. And uh, that's how we're going to do it from now here, from now on here on Computer America. Coming up on tomorrow night's show, in the first hour, we're going to have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. They are the official optimization software of Computer America. And then hour two, the Giz Whiz is here, Mad Magazine's maddest writer. That's right, Dick D. Bartolo is going to be here with us. Some really cool, fun things that he finds for us, seconds. Uh, including uh, a fake TV. <laughs> this is really cool. And uh, also a, a magnetic finger glove. Some of the things that he's got, uh, some devices. And so three different types of high-tech flashlights. Uh, and also a device, it's a, it's a cart that makes it easier to go up and down stairs. <laughs> really cool. These are some great things uh, that he's going to be talking about. Dick DiBartolo in our tone. Also, get this. seconds. A toolbox that you wear on your wrist. I want one of these from Leather. Really? Yeah, a toolbox. I didn't, I didn't realize your, your handyman hand space was so yeah, important. Yeah, I want that. And also a toolbox that fits on your keychain. So, uh, Dick D. Bartolo is going to be with us here tomorrow night. Thank you all so much for being with us here tonight. It was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, Ben and I look forward to speaking to you, or with you. Same bat time, same bat channel. So, until tomorrow night, this is Craig Crossman hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow night. <gasps> yeah, what he said. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Ten seconds. Thank you for using Dog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, everyone. Again, thanks for watching on our, uh, our YouTube channel, our Google Hangouts channel, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, with Dick D. Bartolo. Yep. Good night. Good night.